welcome everybody to our January edition of the Good Book Club. We're so excited to be able to start up in the new year. We'll have Melissa read our mission statement. For those of you that are newer, we always begin each meeting just reading our mission statement to remind us of what we're about. The Good Book Club was created to bring together nuanced Mormons, post-Mormons, and others with a shared interest in Mormonism. We are introspective, critical thinkers seeking to learn, connect, and build relationships through the catalyst of literature. We welcome all who are searching for a safe space to share authentic thoughts, feelings, and ideas through open dialogue and shared experiences relative to Mormon culture. As we deconstruct previous beliefs, we encourage all to find happiness in the process of discovering new religious ideologies, spirituality, and life philosophies. Oh, thank you, Melissa. I love to hear our statement read. That's wonderful. So let's start with our next slide. Great. Okay. We want to just do a little shout out to everybody that came to the planetarium experience. Those that are here local in Utah, we went to the UVU planetarium and we had astronomy professor Joe Jensen give us just a mind blowing presentation. It was really well attended, even more than in the picture. We had some people that left before the picture, but it was really fun just to kind of immerse ourselves in astronomy this month. And now we get to have our wonderful presentation. So thanks to everybody that attended. Um, I didn't plan it. Hey, that's my joke. But I realized that today is Stephen Hawking's birthday and we're having book club on it. So that's just wonderful. So happy birthday to Stephen Hawking. Here is one of his very well known quotes. He says, we are just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star, but we can understand the universe. And that makes us something very special. So happy birthday to Stephen Hawking that fits in right with it because he was, he, I think, helped the masses kind of understand black holes. And so that's something we're going to be talking about today. So happy birthday. <laughs> All right, let's talk very quickly about our upcoming events. If you guys want to mark your calendars for any of these that interest you um, on uh, January 17th, that's Tuesday, we are having a lazy learner event. This is virtual and we'll get the link out to everybody. We are going to be learning about meditation techniques for a peaceful mind and a happy life from the wonderful Nathan Smith of Mind Makes the World podcast. So we'll get more information out about that as the month goes on, but mark your calendars. This is We can all use, I think, in the new year, especially a little meditation, right? So he's going to be talking to us about that. And at the very end of the month, Tuesday, January 31st, we have a bonus event. This book also, this bonus event also includes a book. If you're interested in reading the book, you can download it or grab a copy of this. You do not have to have read the book to attend. But Alyssa Wall is going to be talking to us about her experiences as a wife of Warren Jeffs. So it should be really uh, And I'm reading it right now. It's really a good book. Oh, yeah. I know. We're throwing so many books at you guys, and it's only getting worse. But yeah, you don't have to have read it to attend. But if you'd like to, really good. So, and I wanted to let you guys know about some other reading opportunities. So I also helped John DeLynn run his Mormon Stories book club. And so there are two books on the horizon. If you guys can't get enough of reading, um, we are reading No Nonsense Buddhism for Beginners um, by Noah Rochetta. And there's going to be a Mormon Stories podcast episode where I get to go on and help interview Noah. So if you guys would like to read that and, and participate um, and watch on Friday, January 28th at 10 a.m., that's going on. And then looking even farther forward, a really interesting book. This is about uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. It's called When the Moon Turns to Blood by Leah Sotel. And she is not a Mormon. She is not connected to Mormonism, but she's interested in how high demand, high control, religious environments can produce these anomalies, these situations that happen. So really, I've just barely started the book, but really interesting. And she's going to be talking on Mormon Stories podcast on Friday, March 4th. Um, I'm not sure what the time is yet. I think it's to be decided. It says 10 a.m. there, but I'm not sure we have the time. But anyway, way in advance. So anyway, those books, grab them if you can't get enough to read <laughs> with us already. Um, our book for next month, I'll just mention it very quickly. And then at the end, after our discussion, we'll have Nancy Pratt, who is the discussion leader, give us more of an intro. But this is The Body Keeps the Score. This book was actually recommended by several book club members and also my oldest son, who loves this book so much that he has multiple copies in his car that he hands out to friends. <laughs> so this is going to be amazing. And we'll hear more about this from Nancy at the end of the discussion. 
and that'll be on February 12th. Sorry, Sunday. Um, okay, we're really evangelizing this because this is like a month away. Um, this is an in-person event in Salt Lake City. There is a documentary called The Return of Elder Pingree, a Memoir of a Lapsed Mormon. And it was made by um, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker, Jeff Pingree. He is going to be here in Salt Lake. We're going to be screening the documentary. It's at Bruby's. There is no cost. It's a meet and greet with Jeff, watch the movie, and then a Q&A afterwards. And that is going to be the day before Valentine's Day. That's going to be February the 13th, and it's going to start at 6 o'clock. And if you're not local, if you can't come to this, I can't stress enough how wonderful this documentary is. It is available just to rent on Amazon for $2.99. It is a wonderful documentary about a person who returns to his mission field decades later to kind of deconstruct and just talk to the people that he, he met with before. So it's wonderful. So either rent it on Amazon and watch it, love it, or plan to come to Bruby's on February 13th. It's gonna be really cool. All right, another bonus event. I'm really excited about this one. And this one also has a book attached to it. Dr. Randall Bell, or as I like to call him, Randy Bell, <laughs> is releasing a book called post-traumatic thriving. Now this is coming out on the 11th. Is that Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday? It's coming out this week on audio and every other format. And so he is going to come talk to us. This is going to be the end of February, Tuesday, February 28th. So again, heads up, if you'd like to have read the book before he comes talk to us, grab a copy of post-traumatic thriving, which is available later this week. And also Again, you do not have to have read the book to attend the bonus event. You can just come and listen to Randy Bell. So that's a stack of books that I'm throwing at you guys. <laughs> Hopefully you're okay with that. <laughs> and then just very quickly, some other media that you might be interested in on the radar. Um, in addition to the Good Book Club, we have the Good Media Club, which is a Facebook page where we kind of curate, you know, what's in the, what movies are coming out about Mormonism, what series are out there, just things that we find like that. So um, if you want to just join that Facebook page, um, just throw information out there. And we also have, as I mentioned before, all of our book club meetings are recorded. We have the Good Book Club podcast. So if you'd like to re-listen and podcast podcast format, we should be available on pretty much anywhere that you like to find your podcast. And then we also, Landon and I co-host a um, podcast called Mormon-ish, Living a Joyful Life on the Other Side of Mormonism. And a lot of people that we interview are book club members. Uh, the, the episode that dropped on Friday was with book club member Bill Knowlton of Ally Parent Apparel. Um, he's created a wonderful clothing line to support the LGBTQ community. So we love to interview our book club members. So none of you are safe. We may be calling you, <laughs> but that can be find, found, sorry, on YouTube or also just in podcast format, wherever you get your podcast or just on mormonishpodcast.org. So whew, that's that. All right. Now, enough of all these announcements. Let's get to the main event. What we're really here for, we're going to be discussing um, Hold up the book really quick. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, and our wonderful, amazing discussion leader is Joe Fisher. So take it away, Joe. Hey, hey, welcome. Welcome today. Um, yeah, so this is a this is a book that Neil deGrasse Tyson put together, uh, assembled from a bunch of uh uh articles that he'd written early on, but it, it's got a lot of interesting stuff, and I'm I'm hoping to have enough discussion about people that I, so I'm just interested in it. I'm not a professional or anything like that, but uh, I'm curious to see how other people uh, understood the book and, and whether it was overwhelming or not. But so just to begin with, one of the first things that we deal with in, in astrophysics or physicists is how do we deal with the big world, planets, galaxies, solar systems, and how do we deal with the small world? Uh, atoms, molecules, and stuff, and it's trying to trying to make a uniform thing between those two things. Uh, he he talks in the book when it begins. I'll just give a little summary, and then we can chat a little bit about it. He talks about times that are so small, trillionths of a second, hundreds of trillions of a second. There is a term called the Planck time, which is astronomically small. It's like ten to the minus twenty third seconds. We know nothing before that. Absolutely nothing. There's no laws, there's no rules, anything. But this first book chapter talks about how it all started, where it, where it came from. 
We don't know where it came from, but we can look back and say, after a few hundred trillionths of a second, this happened. After a few trillionths, this happened. After a few millionths, this happened. Uh, in the beginning, some of the very first things that happened were forces were created. There's four fundamental forces. Uh, there's, um, let's see, look at my notes. Yeah, we've got the electromagnetic force, the weak uh, interactions, the strong interactions, and the gravitation. And that's it. If we even today, when we look at it, those are all the four forces that ever exist. And those are created in a trillionth of a second. Uh, this little chart on the side is showing some of the things that come about. The, the quarks are in orange. We'll talk a little, it talks a little bit about quarks and who discovered those and how they react. Leptons, they're the like the green on the bottom, the bosons or the blue, and the Higgs. These are all the particles that we know of. And these are the things that make up atoms, they make up molecules, all the stuff that puts everything together. And one of the one of the least understood forces is gravity. Um, I And some of those things, like if you look at them, they've got weird names like tau and stuff like that. They're mostly theoretical also. Like the only things that we've actually observed are electrons, which is this little E down in the bottom left quadrant. Um, and quarks, we've kind of observed those and stuff like that. So, so that's kind of chapter one. Uh, some of the people that were of interest in that are, uh, let's see. They talked a little bit about um saturande not bose he was named after that leptons comes from the greek word of light and quarks was just something we came up with to give some classification uh so yeah it, how how did everybody feel about the first chapter landon's got his hand up i think Oops, sorry, I had to unmute me there. Um, okay. no, th this was this was just incredible to me. Uh, the the time frames when you looked at the, you know, like you said, uh, that the first couple chapters were, were covering millionth of a second, thousandths of a second. That then that these forces came into into being. But uh, one of the interesting things to me was when we were at the planetarium when we talked about the Big Bang because I never understood. Um, how the entire universe could be packed into one singularity and and, and how how it could be that small and uh, the professor guy pointed out uh he said there 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 was no mass prior to the big bang the big bang is what created it so the protons the electrons all of that was created in that first uh few seconds and then he went on to say that uh, all the helium in the entire universe was created in 3 minutes it, that the temperature after the Big Bang was only adequate to, to produce helium for three minutes, and that all the helium in the entire universe was was uh, produced in that time frame. And that was just mind blowing to me. I was just in, in awe that uh, we, we kind of make fun of the, you know, oh, the Earth is only 6,000 years old. Uh, but everything in the universe, and we know the Earth isn't 6,000 years old, but it's it's strange to think that all the helium in the universe was made in three minutes. You know? So it kind of put things in perspective for me as, a, as I saw that, uh, how amazing the entire universe is. So. Good job, thanks. Jackie? Yes, for me, um, a couple of things. First of all, like quantum mechanics was like what Einstein and in, quote invented it. And that's like 1916, like it's a hundred years old. So we've, you know, conscious beings have gone thousands and thousands of years trying to figure out the universe and it's a firmament and this flat and talk about a paradigm shift in less than a hundred years. Look at what we know about the universe. And so it's mind boggling for me to realize how quickly we as humans have to catch up with this math and physics that just blew our minds. Yeah, no, de definitely. Um, so we'll talk about it in some of the later chapters, but uh, until we can discover it, until we can see it, we have a very hard time understanding it. And then 
having some sort of language around it is very difficult too. Uh, I, I find it interesting that when we talk about these things, so I, as you're looking at this little picture, this model of particles, you're going, well, where's the, where's the atoms? Where'd they show up? What are these things? So if you look at this orange part, the top part, the quarks, those are the things within the neutrons and protons that put up the atoms. So you don't see any atoms here because they are things smaller than that. And we're not even clear underneath there what's underneath there. This is just what we have today. And we'll eventually find and detect and understand things beyond that. Uh, yeah, let's see. Lu Luann. Um, I know what gravity is, obviously, uh -huh. because we interact with it every day. But strong force and weak force just don't give me a picture of anything. Um, oh, yeah. We can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Appreciate that. Sure. Um, so you have, okay, so you have the atom, right? And the atom has a neutron, a proton, and an and a electron. The electron is what gives the electromagnetic force. It's the, it, it, it's affected by it. Uh, it's what holds it to the atom. And then you have the neutron and proton that's held together by the strong nuclear force. The thing that holds the different atoms together in a molecule are the weak nuclear forces. So those are the kind of things that are holding pieces together. And when we split an atom, we're breaking that weak nuclear force. When we split the individual pieces off the atom in the, in the colliders, that's breaking the strong nuclear force. And so that's kind of where those things are all held together. And then the electromagnetic force kind of keeps uh, some of those things together too. And, and I apologize, it is a little fuzzy because I'm not doing a great job of describing mm, that. But good, that's, where those, that's where those forces are living. Uh, and gravity, we understand that because we're stuck to this planet. And it's, we, we understand its effects. We don't understand what it really is. This is mm -hmm. kind of still a mystery, right? But yeah, those, that weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force, that's what's going on in the fusion of suns. That's what's going on in nuclear reactors. That's what's going on in nuclear bombs is uh, releasing that energy based on E equals MC squared. It's, it's giving up all that energy. So did that, hopefully that. Thank helped. you. Good, Thank good you. question. Yeah, good clarification. Um, the, the other thing that's kind of interesting to talk about, we're up to what, a, a trillionth of a second. Light has yet to exist. We don't have any kind of visibility. Um, these are just forces and particles that have shown up. Uh, hydrogen has shown up, helium shown up. The universe is basically a couple hundred thousand light years across. It's not very big at all, but it's expanding hugely fast. It's going very fast, faster than the speed of light. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but as we observe things in the universe, we're looking back in time. And the farther back in time, we see things moving faster. Uh, and, we, and we can get to those questions later, but but that's kind of where this whole idea that's, that the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light is a long time ago. Today, we don't necessarily see that near us, but back in time, we do. Um, any, anybody else want to chat about the uh, Big Bang and what happened before? Because we don't know what happened before. <laughs> yeah, Tom. Tom, you're muted. I know. I know. I wanted to hear you say that. No. Um... I just, when I hear this, this, these explanations of what happened and everything, of course, my mind's completely blown like a lot of us. And I'm a little person at this point now, very, very tiny and insignificant and don't even matter. But I want to know what comes to mind. Maybe I can't remember if this is all discussed later. Maybe it is, but it's the, now, how do they know this stuff? Like, uh -huh. that's where I really go. How did you get there 14 billion years back? Like, how did, what are the, you know, I know we can't do all that today, but if that's the question that hits me really hard because I can, at least I can try to contribute in some way to say, well, wait, how do you know that? <laughs> and then sure. and that's learning a, how they did all that really helps me more to, 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 to appreciate all this stuff in the beginning when he just starts talking in the, the first chapter and I'm just going, oh, I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, that's how I, I feel really dumb right now. And and it is kind of, no, no, you're fine. Um, one thing I think was frustrating for me years ago, and it was before I deconstructed religion, but it was kind of like understanding what exactly is it scientists are saying. We're going to come across two terms, and those two 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 terms are 
dark energy and dark matter. Now, they sound like they're actual things, and, and we'll find out that they kind of are. But when we have conversations about science, sometimes we come across something, we don't understand it, but we can't sit there and say, well, you know that thing we don't understand? That thing we don't understand? That thing, you know, papers have to be written, things have to be explored. So they come up with terms. So for example, these quarks, the top six things on there, they had to come up with a name. And so they just came up with a name, and then they called it quark. And so that way we can now have conversations. So in a lot of ways, when you listen to a scientist talk, they talk as if that thing is a real thing yet, but they're still kind of saying, we don't really know. So that's kind of where dark energy and dark matter sit. We see things, we kind of get it, but we don't, we don't know how to talk about it just yet. So we'll, we'll label it this. And then of course, the worst possible thing is science fiction goes, let me write a book about it. Boom. Right. And now you get conversations on the radio with people going on about, well, you know, when the dark energy interfect interfered with the, the, you know, the guy in the basement and all of a sudden this happened. And because you think you're actually talking about real things, you, you're still talking about concepts and things we don't understand. So in a lot of ways, yeah, it's, it's hard to kind of read science and say, wait, is this something we fully understand yet? Or do we kind of understand it yet? And, and scientists, there's assumed knowledge and audience that, yeah, we don't, we don't quite understand. One thing we learned when we went to the planetarium is uh, the, the, the guy in charge there said, we should call it transparent matter instead of dark matter. Because it's not dark. It's not absent. We, we see it, but we look through it right? And so in a way, our language has to adopt also. So a quick answer to your question, how do we know this, which I love that question, because everybody needs to say that. How do we know this? How do you know this? It start, you know, the history's long, and the book talks a little bit about it. And, and, it, and I will, I will throw out this, it's probably going to be at least a year study of just trying to get through all the terminology. But you have people like Erwin Hubble, or Edwin Hubble, that notice something. He's like, oh, well, it looks like everything's racing away from us. Okay, well, why is it racing away from us? Oh, it looks like something's pushing it away. Oh, it looks like, and they just keep walking it back, just keep walking it back. And so, so they created the, uh, in Switzerland, they have the Large Hadron Collider. I'm really curious, who, who has heard of the Large Hadron Collider and what do they think it is? I'll just give a quick question there. Yeah, Bruce. Oh, I've heard of it. It's it's in a lot of uh, movie themes, and I think they're trying to produce particles that don't naturally exist easily. At least that's yeah. my answer. good. Good one, Jackie. Uh, my daughter has a friend who is actually working there, ah. so like that's like whoa, you know, super impressive, super cool. So. <laughs> that's our claim to fame there you go i've got uh, a question where did the big bang happen near colob <laughs> well <laughs> do we want to talk about real things or what we can observe <laughs> trigger alert um so who has heard that the hadron collider is going to open up a gateway to hell okay that's that's a yeah. big yeah, that's a big thing that people are like, well, we can't turn this thing on because it'll suddenly suck everything into it. Yeah, it's never going to do that. That's not what it's doing. Uh, but it is a high energy, high uh, magnetic process that splits these things apart. Um, the e equals mc squared equation is solid. It, it, whatever little pieces of matter, you're going to get a lot of energy. To get that matter to split, you need a lot of energy. So you get these things, it's a 20 mile radius tube underground that we get these things accelerating uh, a little bit of hydrogen accelerating near to the speed of light and then we smash it into a bunch of part bunch of other hydrogen and helium stuff and and smash that thing apart and then look and see what happened that's really all that's going on uh we find particles like you said bruce they don't exist in nature uh, we'll get to the periodic table later most of the elements below uranium just don't exist they exist for five seconds or ten seconds they're they're manufactured but they exist because we can we can create them in these in these experiments. But we're not going to create a black hole in the middle of Sweden. We're not going to create a big, you know, gateway to hell. Uh, has anybody heard of the God particle? Uh, it, and this was popular a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, 
who wants to who wants to describe what the god particle is rebecca no i was going to answer about the particle collider and i'll let someone oh, okay else. yeah um, i was going to say that yes i definitely have followed those conspiracy theories because there have been a lot of problems with the collider like there have been accidents there and problems and fires and i have read that the only explanation they've been able to come up with is time travelers coming back and trying to disable it M so that we be. don't <laughs> kill ourselves. Yeah, no, I, these are legitimate scientific papers on the dark web. No, so I actually asked the, <laughs> I asked uh, our astronomy professor about that, and he kind of shook his head like you just did, like that, ah, you know. But it is interesting to think about, you know, because yeah. on paper, you know, the collider sounds like, wow, this, you know, this could be something. What are we doing, you know? And the idea that somebody would be coming back in time to say, no, no, don't. So, anyway, interesting. That was just my little conspiracy theory comment. <laughs> no, no worries. I'm, I'm a little worried now. I might be getting away from the book. So tell me if a I'm getting a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it's so fun though. It's so fascinating. Okay. R really quick to answer my question. I asked the God particle. The reason they call it the God particle is because it's as elusive as God. It has nothing to do with theology. <laughs> and it's that one in the middle, the Higgs boson, the purple one. That's the God particle. <laughs> okay. All right. So chapter one, anything else left on chapter one before we move on to chapter two? Okay. Uh, so chapter two. So we talked, uh, Tom asked, how do we know this, right? Oh, wait, go back one slide really quick. Let's just look at that for a second. Yeah, so this is kind of the, if anybody sees a picture of this, we're talking about things that are happening right there by that little light on the far left side, 10 to the minus some big old number of seconds, just at astronomically small. And then we get these neutrons and protons created. And then like uh, Landon was saying, in the three minutes where the A is there, that's when hydrogen gets created. That's when things start being created is, is a few minutes into the thing. And then from that, we get 300,000 years of just particles bouncing around, you know, atoms creating, stuff like that. And then we start getting collections of these things. And that's, we get into galaxies and star formations and all sorts of stuff so anyway that's the that's kind of the picture and it's it's not obviously it's not linear you know we're going from hey, <laughs> tiny tiny Joe, seconds to long times one thing that was kind of amazing was to me was the the light uh, you, you know you said there was no light and i can't remember how long it took it's like 150,000 years or something before light could get out because the particles were so close yeah. together that light just kept would just bounce around it couldn't get out so that's amazing to think that you know went that long and no light existed from all of this i thought that was pretty amazing exactly yeah it was a it was a unvisible universe <laughs> so okay anyway so we talked a little bit about that uh, yeah let's go on to chapter two okay so what what we what we make it what we decided I don't know who we, the scientists, we started noticing that we can detect hydrogen. We didn't detect hydrogen on the earth. We detected hydrogen coming from the sun. And so we started noticing that we can detect hydrogen from other suns. And so the laws that work with us around us are the same laws that work out in the universe. And so one of the rules is Whatever's going on around us nearby in our solar system is also going on around everywhere else. So they become universal. And once we accept the fact that the laws are universal, we can start making decisions about, oh, this is what happened here and there. If we can't say that the laws work the same millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, you know, millions and millions of light years away, then we don't know what's going on. And, and if you get into conversations with, uh, I don't wanna bring this up too much. Anyway, you get into a conversation with other people, they, they tend to believe that those laws are different. And so things don't make sense, right? But what we've observed is that these laws all work. Uh, the conservation of laws of mass, energy, momentum, electric charge, those laws are fundamental across, you know, galaxies, across planets, across everything. Uh, one thing that he talked about in the chapter was that who, who gets frustrated hearing about, you know, well, we know this, now we're going to change our mind and we know this, and now we're going to change our mind and know this. Um, what We're not really changing our mind. We are understanding better what we knew. Uh, and whereas, you know, people change their mind. So it's kind of conflated, right? People get that, that idea conflated. What we found is that 
we tend not to say things are absolute, like we can't absolutely know this, but the speed of light is pretty absolute. No matter what happens, we're not going to break that. And then, of course, you have the conversation about the universe expanding faster than the speed of light. The one exception is the speed of light within the universe is, is a speed limit that won't ever get broken. But the, the universe, like we said, at the early top part of the universe, it was ex the entire space time that we exist in, that thing can move faster than the speed of light. And there's nothing preventing us. We don't know of any rules that will prevent us from that happening. So, uh, and I put this hey, plate here. Yes, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That was something I, because when I was reading, it said like in the first like few seconds of the universe, or maybe it's a few minutes, it was like 150,000 light years across. And so I couldn't, so that kind of explains it because I was going, if we can't go faster than the speed of light, how could the universe be 150,000 light years across before within just seconds of it being created? But right. the, the universe itself can move faster than the speed of light. But within the universe, only light can travel at that speed. That's the difference. It yes, like. that, yes, exactly. The the space time, everything, the mat, all the stuff that makes the universe, that thing can go as fast as it wants. And we don't know the rules around that just yet. But as far as within that thing, yeah, we cannot go faster than the speed of light. Um, I put this little plate in here because he talked a little bit about the Voyager probes, the Pioneer probes. Uh, we had sent these four probes out to the universe, and they are currently the longest running man-made machine we've ever built. 50, 40, 50 years they've been going on. And they have these little plates. You can go download the sound off the internet, and they show where we're at in the universe if you want to try to find us and stuff like that. And, and there's been some controversy about what you know, what if an alien finds this? You know, what's going to happen? And, and he makes the joke that Saturday Night Live said... Uh, you know, aliens found our plates and they want more Chuck Berry, <laughs> send more Chuck Berry. Uh, but these, if you look at our, if, if you look at our solar system, you got our sun, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, blah, 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 out to Jupiter, Plat, Pluto. These probes have passed that. They are now far out into the interstellar space of the Milky Way. And we are receiving signals Voyager, I think, is still broadcasting. Pioneer, I don't think we've been able to hear them for a couple of years. Um, but Voyager is very faint. Every couple of years, we'll point to where we think, it, you know, where it is and maybe get a signal from it. But it, it's eventually going to die out. But these things will just go until, until so, they either hit something or destroy it, or we may eventually hear back from whoever finds them. Um, so any, any, con any comments or discussions on Chapter 2? Look at my notes really quick on chapter two. Uh, one thing he mentioned, he says that there's about 80% of the gravity in the universe that we can't detect. And this gets, gets into the whole dark matter thing that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, do, 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 Newton's laws are really just uh general specific versions of einstein laws so we talked a little bit about how things always change right newton came up with the laws of gravity and einstein came and kind of corrected them a little bit they didn't they didn't fundamentally change everything they didn't reinvent everything which local newspapers and news would like people to read their papers so they make some you know you know we this changes everything now it doesn't change everything but it does kind of help us understand a little bit better so just be aware of that, I guess, as you as we talk through science and stuff. Okay, chapter three. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about where light came from. Um, we've got, so when the sun provides light, you know, it's giving us uh, things we call photons. Photons are basically, they act like a wave and they act like a particle. Now they can move at the speed of light because they have no mass, but they behave like a particle that has mass. So we just call them photons, but they're the things that create light. And when we were talking about light being created very early in the universe, um, it, it's not the light frequencies. We can go, kind of talk a little bit about this, the electromagnetic spectrum. 
but they run at a certain frequency. When we see things with our eyes, we see a certain bandwidth in that magnetic frequency. Things that are above that are like ultraviolet and infrared and high gamma rays and stuff like that. Uh, so as the universe kind of created light back in the very few seconds of the of the Big Bang, then that light kind of stretched out and got higher and higher into the frequencies and that became infrared. And so when we started detecting this sort of stuff, um, we got into what does it what does it mean? And, and it became cooler, dimmer and stuff like that over time. And eventually when we look at it today, it's this cosmic background radiation. And I don't think he goes too much into it, but let me see my notes on that. Yeah, so they, when they, when they were actively bouncing around in the Big Bang, they were, you know, just fast and energetic. And then they kind of cooled down by a factor of a thousand and they're considered microwaves. So the things that warm up your food in the microwave, that's, that's what we're detecting now. Um, every time we try to see something, we it peaks somewhere, like light will peak. The incandescent light bulbs are inefficient. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, and then he talks a little bit about LEDs that become more efficient. Uh, and, the, and then the CMB comes from the leftovers. He talked a little bit about the people that detected it. Um, Gamo kind of predicted it. Uh, Lamare, Lamontre predicted it. They did some initial work. They estimated that the the universe should be about two point, you know, five degrees to two point seven degrees. They the Hubble, um, Einstein. They made all these predictions, and they they kind of got within, you know, very slow slow percent close percentage. Uh, they talked about the the guys at Bell Lab, Robert Wilson. Uh, they talked a little bit about doing some research. They were trying to listen to uh, radio frequencies, and they kept getting this noise, and they didn't know what it was. And so they went and cleaned out the radio detector, and they found some pigeon poop, and they're like, okay, well, it must be that. And they kind of do that. But eventually they said, hey, there's this other thing going on. And it, they got their Nobel Prize in 1978 for detecting this background radiation. Um, if anybody remembers like the old, we don't have it anymore, like digital TVs, but the old TV sets, you remember Poltergeist and it had the little staticky stuff coming from it. That's the actual detection of radios and the micro microwave background radiation. Um, Bell Labs did something in 2006. Uh, they got a, a Nobel Prize for observing, the uh, Nobel Prize for observing across the range of the spectrum. Uh, Henry Dinky and boo, 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 Robert. Do, do, do. Uh, back to Tom's question: How do we know these things? Uh, he talked. He talked a little bit about cyanogen. Cyanogen. Uh, it's warmer in the younger universe, and so that's why we can see it from 500 years away. I don't know. I don't know much. How much I want to keep talking? Maybe uh, if you guys have some opinions, we can hear that. Maybe it's still a little just too overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, Tom. Sorry. Um, so my mind is still being blown. But I think <laughs> it's fascinating. No, I think what really helps is is learning the history, studying, like studying, if we were to do this, for me at least, studying the history of how they get back to 14 billion years. And we can't do that all today. Right. It's just so fascinating because then it... You, you understand where they were going and what they were led to and what they discovered along the way. And then it, it's just little by little they're getting there, but it's so fascinating that they're pursuing one thing and then they find something else or they discover a new question they need to ask or whatever. It's science. It just blows my mind. I, I just want to make one real quick comment. I, I, I wanted to make back on that slide where it showed the uh, sun starting to appear, the little ball light, the very first. Oh yeah. Yeah. Slide. And it looked like all this evolution in the space is occurring. And, and I kind of thought, well, it can't be that far off if you kind of do a microcosm of that with a planet like Earth and say all those elements and something similarly occurred to where then life started to manifest itself. I mean, you could almost take another, I don't know, just this model here, this seeing this slide reminded me like, oh, well, shoot, if the cosmos was doing this, 
Well, it can't be far off. Darwin wasn't that far off. Why yeah. did, and we we demonized the hell out of that concept, which is just awful. Because then you look at this and go, well, if that, you know, that can't happen either because it's 6,000 years. We just get trapped. And I'm just, I was asking the question last night in dinner going, hey, Rebecca, why, what did I say, Rebecca? Was like, why, why, what was, what was religion so afraid of? What did I say? Do you remember what I said last night? Because I can't remember. Do you remember what I was saying? Because um, said- I listened to like 25% of what you say. So no, I'm sorry. I do, too. <laughs> I do too. Okay. So that's a no. You say so many amazing things that I can't possibly trap. I just all of them. like what was religion trying to do? Why were they trying to trap us? Why were they trying to keep us in this box and and not allowing all this thought to go forward? I don't know. And if it just comes down to power structures trying to maintain, it's just really sad that we've been prevented from. Uh, we've taken longer to learn this stuff or be exposed to it is all I'm saying. So that's all. I'm sorry. I'm having an experience with it. And it's just kind of blowing my mind. These are all the kind of thoughts and ideas that I'm having. So thank you. Now, one thought, Tom, I was thinking is that like not necessarily power that they overtly think of, but they have such trouble saying, I don't know, or I don't understand. So anything like this that, that's blowing their minds are like, nope, can't be true because I can't understand it. So it can't be true. So if, I, if I'm a prophet of God and I can't understand it, it must be false. Yeah. Let's see. I don't know, Bruce or Jackie, who was first. Jackie? Uh, for me, the paradigm, you know, the metaphor is kind of amazing because I'm kind of like, you know, you know, like if you want to keep this metaphor going on, like a faith crisis, you know, when I would originally see science and, and all of this in high school and college, like the walls went up. Nope, nope, nope. Can't understand it. Too big, too much. Mm, whoop, walls up. And so opening this book and reading it, it's like, hey, I kind of can grasp this. I can kind of learn. It's amazing. It's opened my eyes. And so I think that's been such a big thing for me. And, and I've emotionally connected to the book because it's like, once I've opened my eyes in in religion, now I can open it in other areas of study and learning. And I just really appreciate the metaphors that the author Neil deGrasse Tyson uses because it's really helped me to begin to grasp. I'm really at a kindergarten level, but it's enough that I want to stay with it and keep with it. And I I, for me, I'm just being really quiet during your lecture because I'm just trying to learn and I'm just really appreciating you and how you're explaining this even further for me. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce. Yeah, it just kind of brings up the thought when you talked about, you know, we learn stuff and we change the narrative and stuff like that. I know just more down to earth stuff that we have in our lives you know we have the the church's narratives and stuff but as more science and things are learned the what's learned isn't going towards the church's narrative and it's just you know it seems to me that we need to kind of say okay what direction is this going our understanding going into and you know the the closed-minded nature of it um and uh, and just a quick uh, thing, yeah, Landon, can you check on the waiting room? We are. Okay. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, let's see, I don't know if Rebecca or more JJ was first, but whoever wins. <laughs> no, is this my cue, I guess? <laughs> I, I never understood why a lot of religious people had a hard time with this. The Big Bang Theory actually initiated with a, a Jesuit priest. It was George Lemaitre that came up with it. And he was, he was a scientist as well, but I don't understand why people are bothered by this. Even Darwin was not, people like to make him a, a symbol or a person of atheism. He was not an atheist. He may have been agnostic, right. but there was nothing that said he was anti-God and, and he wasn't looking to refute or get rid of religion. You could say that about Lemaitre as well. It's or Einstein or Feynman or any of these people, I guess. So I, I never understood that part, why they feel so threatened by science. I, I think it's interesting because religion actually was very scientific back in the Middle Ages and early times. Um, 
And it, it wasn't until later on when like people like Karl Popper came out and said, look, we've got to make some separations and decisions here. But yes, I completely agree. We shouldn't villainize these people and try to make them out to be atheists because they weren't. They were they just wanted to understand how the universe works. And they had their understanding that it came from God and they were trying to make this connection. And it was really just observations. They're like, hey, look at this, notice this and stuff like that. But yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, kind of in those same lines. I've talked before about how I was raised by very orthodox Mormon parents and they were both scientists, like master's level zoologist. And my dad was a PhD level nuclear scientist, worked with splitting the atoms, but they never ever taught me about the origins of the universe or anything like that. It was all from the Bible. That's what I learned, you know, God and the, you know, creation. So then I go to school and I start learning a little about, about this, you know, in different science classes. And I come home and I ask my parents, you know, this is what I'm learning. And they're like, well, it's still all God because God is working through natural laws, right? We've always heard this, of course, in the LDS church. And then me being a tiny little critical thinker, even though I'm an Orthodox Mormon, <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, so if God is bound by natural laws, then is he God? <laughs> right. I don't know. I kind of thought about that when I was a teenager and this book kind of made me think about it again in that context. I don't know if anybody has ever thought about that, but, but I agree there's some fear. And, and I have to say, I don't know if you all caught on Facebook um, the adorable picture that Landon and Melinda posted of their grandson reading a baby book on astrophysics. So yes, I'm glad that other people have the chance to be raised in a way where they have this information from very early on. No, great, great comments, great inputs. Uh, nice, nice chat on the side. Yeah, we can get into all sorts of discussions about psychology and stuff, but for whatever it is, the, the human brain doesn't like change. <laughs> it, we have to fight that. And, and having a answer is helpful, whether it's a good answer or not, but yeah, good, great, great points. Let's see. Hey, uh, hey Joe. Yes. Go uh, ahead. One thing though, is, is you in the middle ages, especially religion really restricted, um, science, you know, uh, Galileo had to, you know, Yep. say that no well i was wrong and and take everything back so he wasn't burned at the stake and uh so they've kind of restricted religion rather than let it go and you kind of wonder what the world would be like had they encouraged the scientific discoveries and instead of retarding it would we be even more advanced at this point uh because they they let it go it's just an interesting thought anyway no it's fascinating and as a side note uh Kepler, Johannes Kepler, who dis, who kind of identified the planets orbiting the sun. Um, he never really published his book, but he was never punished as bad as uh, Galileo was. Um, so it depended on what region you were in. But one of the things that Kepler said in his book, he said, I don't, I'm not making a point that the earth and the sun ro revolve differently, but if you put the sun in the middle, it works out better. So yeah, depending on where you're at, you got different pressures for sure yes go ahead bruce yeah uh so galileo kepler had ecclesiastical roulette yeah so yep <laughs> no good good point but to be fair kepler did not want to publish his book he, he didn't publish his book till after he passed away so he he kind of knew there was a problem but he wasn't gonna like ruffle some feathers good yeah great let's see chapter four um let's see so in this chapter he's talking a little bit about so we've got all this stuff out in space and we talk about galaxies but what's in between them what's going on in the different places so currently uh has anybody gone out on a very clear night far away from the sky far away from the cities and seen the milky way in the sky um so we are in the middle of that if you look at the picture kind of the right right there where it says chapter four that's kind of what our milky way looks like um we we can only kind of take a we can't take a picture of it obviously because we're not outside of it but we can kind of get observations of what we think it is it's a it's a bar a spiral bar galaxy um and the closest neighbor that we have is the andromeda galaxy uh if you if you know where cassiopeia is in the sky andromeda is kind of just off to the side of it 
and it's in the Andromeda constel uh, constellation. But on a really clear night with binoculars, you can look up and kind of see this little fuzzy smudge. And that is the closest guy. And I think he's, what, a couple million light years away from us. Eventually, he's going to collide with us. But we have all sorts of stuff in between. If you look kind of to the left, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you have these two little smudges called the, the Magellanic Clouds, the small and large Magellanic Clouds. These guys are kind of our neighbors. Um, I can't remember how far away they are, but they are they are orbiting along with the Milky Way nearby. And we can see them, you know, through binoculars, kind of with the naked eye a little bit. But we have all these things that are floating around in there. We have these things called quasars. Uh, they're they're quasi stars, so they're not quite a star, but they're not quite a, a non-star. But they pulsate. They're, they're pulsars. They have these like regularities to them. We've received uh, radio signals. Uh, we've identified these little things that are just floating around in the universe. Um, let me get my notes here. Really make sure I'm not like off in left field. Uh, oh yeah. So the Andromeda galaxy is two million light years away. Uh, before we had telescopes, we couldn't detect any of these things. We just saw them with the naked eye. Uh, we have dwarf galaxies about, um, they outnumber regular galaxies 10 to one. Uh, they're just these small collections of galaxies, but they're not fully spiral. They're not fully structured, but they've just got like little dim stars in them. They hang out by large galaxies. They're eventually consumed by them. About 10% of large galaxies show sign of collisions with other galaxies. Uh, there may be as many, they call them vagabond stars, just stars randomly floating around out there. Um, there could be all sorts of them. There's supernovas going on. Uh, we identify them. The hot, hot, the hot gas clouds exceed their galaxies by a factor of 10. Just huge, huge chunks of, galaxy, of gases out there. Um, so forth like that. Let's see. Old blue galaxies, long, distant, far away. Quasars, quasars came about, uh, we don't have a lot of quasars nearby us. They're kind of like in the old, old part of the universe. So uh, the, did, you get, did you guys remember talking about gravitational lensing? So whenever you have light from far away, so this is the lower left picture we have right here. So let's say we're in the right, we're in the lower right corner. We're watching this star. And there's something behind that star. As the light comes around the star, gravitational pushes it around. And so we can see behind it. It kind of becomes this thing that we can see far. So we can get this kind of picture of what's farther back in history. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if that was clear. Whenever you look into the, whenever you look into the, into the universe, we're looking back in time. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the Orion galaxy, or if you go out on a clear night, which we haven't had since Christmas, uh, up in the southern hemisphere, well, kind of to the east, you can see the Orion galaxy. It's very popular. It looks like the hunter with the three stars in the belt. If you follow the three stars down to the left, there's a little star there called Cirrus. And that is the closest star to us. Every star you see in the Milky Way, when you go out at night without a, without a telescope, almost everything you see is nearby us. Uh, none of that is outside of our galaxy. That's all nearby stuff. But if you look at Cirrus um, and the Orion, I apologize. My whole train of thought about gravitational lensing and Orion <laughs> kind of lost. So gravitational lensing, you can go out and you can see these things far away that are outside of our Milky Way galaxy and far into the distance. And it, it bends around the, the gravitational sources. So, um, so there's all these things just floating around in the universe that we have. Some of, uh, some of the things, he'll talk about it in the next chapter, I think, about uh, roundness, being round. A lot of things form nicely and a lot of things don't form nicely so you get all this kind of weird stuff going on um any comments about chapter four what's going on between the galaxies and what's happening out there in the universe yeah landon one of the things at the planetarium that was really cool was that you know the center of a galaxy is a black hole uh in most cases i think i don't know if that's 
true everywhere, but uh, the spiral galaxies anyway, it's, it's a black hole. And they kind of, one of the films, we took a journey into the black hole and it kind of showed us going from our, where we're at in the galaxy closer. And it was amazing that when you got near that black hole, the num number of stars there are so close together that uh, you know, there's like a billion stars in our galaxy alone. And as you get closer to the center, they get more and more and more of them are, are closer together. So it was really kind of cool to see that as we flew through there and to, to just see how, I mean, there were millions of stars <laughs> right around that black yeah. hole. And, and you don't, you know, you look out there and you see, a, you know, you look at how many stars are in the sky, but you're talking billions of stars and there's billions of galaxies with billions of stars. It's just unimaginable when you, when you think of it that way. Yeah. The brain can't process it. It's, it's impressive. Um, yeah. We've been around for so long that there is, there is this idea that, so notice that the galaxy, like in our picture here, we've got all these little stars that are orbiting around the center black hole there and all this other stuff, but there's probably just random stars floating around in the middle of nowhere, just flying around. They've got ejected from their galaxy. They're just all by themselves. Um, but yeah, just a bunch of stuff floating around. Um, let's see. Let's try chapter five. Okay, so now here comes in what's going on with dark matter. Okay, so when we were looking at... They made some observations and they noticed if you look, if you look at a tire, like you look over at a spinning tire, right? If you look at the center of the tire and kind of think about a point on the center there, it's going kind of fast, right? But then if you look at the outside rim of the tire, a point on there is going a lot faster to get around, right? So near the center, it's not going as fast, but out on the edge, it's going really fast. So that's the way kind of like things move around in a circular orbit. What we noticed about some of these galaxies, and this uh, this galaxy right here on the left, this coma thing, this is the one they observed. They noticed that the stars on the outside weren't going as fast as they should. So what's going on here? Why are they going you know, different speeds and stuff like that? And so they came up with this idea that there must be something changing it, right? That's not keeping it together. And so they came up with this thing and they said, it's got to be, we don't know. So we're going to call it dark matter. And so that's where the term came. And then like we talked earlier that it's easier to remember it as transparent. Um, so dark matter is basically the accommodation of the fact that we can't measure stuff, right? It's not measuring. And what we see is uh, that if you look at a galaxy around the outside edge of that galaxy, there's probably huge clumps of dark matter there that's causing this kind of different speed and balances that's going on. Uh, and I always like to point out women in science. Uh, there was Vera Florence Cooper. Um, she helped identify that these, the empty volumes of space have fast moving matter, dark halos, dark matter that's large by a factor of six generally. And we can't see them, we can't detect them. And so we call it dark, but it's probably better called transparent. Uh, and there was a scientist, Fritz Zick Zwicky, uh, that he kind of made, he did the study of the, the, the coma Bernices and found out that the velocities just didn't make sense. They should be flying apart, but they're not. So, um, let's see, it's one of the mysteries, right? So let's see, dark matter, gravity is well understood on small objects like the earth. The dark matter doesn't affect things like the Earth and the Moon, right? It affects things and massive stars. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. We don't find chunks of we don't find chunks of dark matter. Matter is the frosting. Gravity needs dark matter, or we would not have a universe. And there's a couple things that got. Um, but doo -doo -doo -doo. He talked a little bit about the Michelson Morley experiment. I don't know if you want to talk about that too much, but it was an experiment that kind of early on, we kind of thought that there was this fluid that everything that was moving through and the Mickelson Morley kind of came out and said, yeah, it, it doesn't exist. There's just nothing out there. And so that that's kind of where they decided that, you know, we just have gravity acting on these things. 
Let's see, do, do, do particles that interact with gravity, though not light, neutrinos. He talked a little bit about neutrinos. Um, neutrinos are basically coming out of the sun. They don't interact with matter. But like right now, as we're speaking, there's probably hundreds of billions of neutrinos passing through your body every second. Everybody on Earth is getting impacted by this. Um, I, went on a, I went on a vacation to South Dakota. And in South Dakota, near... Um, Deadwood, there's a little mine that they've taken over, the scientific community has taken over, and they've put a neutrino detector down in there. It's about a mile underground. And every once in a while, these hundreds of billions of neutrinos that are flying through the earth, they'll hit something in this detector, and we'll see it. And so we can kind of detect it, but yeah, it hardly ever interacts with us. But uh, he talked a little bit about those. Um, but if you're ever in South Dakota, it's kind of a fun little place to stop by and check out. Uh, let's see, do, do, do. 100 billion neutrinos pass through your thumbnail every second, and we, we can't stop them. Dark matter doesn't seem to stop either. So that's kind of where we're at with the world of dark matter is there's something out there that's causing the universe to behave in a way that we can't see it. And so all you remember how I said we come up with these words that are like, well, we don't know what it is, but we'll call it this. And so that's kind of the existence of dark matter. And of course, it's now shown up in, in, uh, you know, literature, books and science fiction and stuff. And, and you'll get in, you'll hear people argue about dark matter, and it doesn't even make sense what they're saying. And it's clear that they don't understand what's going on. So if you ever get in a conversation with somebody that's talking about dark matter and how it's affecting your basement or the moon or something like that, you'll, you'll know that they don't know what they're talking about. So any questions or comments about dark matter or how it, what your understanding of it is or if it's confusing or not confusing? I thought at the at the planetarium they showed that that little film where the uh, two I think it was galaxies with dark matter collided and then they could see the reaction of the dark matter. I don't know if you remember that from there, but they kind of said you could even though you can't see the dark matter, it, it was clear that there was a, another force pulling on that when, when those two collided and they could see the dark matter like switched from one of the galaxies to the other or something like that. I don't, I, I didn't okay. fully understand it, but it was kind of cool to, to see that they actually, you know, they were saying, here's how we know it's out there. Uh, and, you know, we, we suspected it was there. And then when this incident happened, we could see the effect and that we could see the dark matter shift. So. Right, right. No, no, it was interesting. Yeah, Melissa. I just wanted to say it kind of cracked me up and you're like, oh, and it affects small things like the earth. And I'm like, small, you know, it just kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like this mind blowing, like, yeah, we're teeny tiny little speck on, you know, because, you know, we think of small. Yeah, it, it was just when you said that it was just kind of like, wow, I yeah. loved it. Well, thank you. Um. Yeah, it's it, it's fun to listen to astrophysicists talk. There's a girl, Dr. Becky, and she's from England, and she's she always does YouTubes and TikToks and stuff, but she'll talk about dark matter and stuff, and it's fun to hear the parts that they know and the parts that they don't know. And, and, and in general literature, when you listen to it, it's hard to make that distinction. Like, what is it that we know and what we don't know and stuff? But yeah. Let's see, chapter six, what do we got? Dark energy. Okay, so now when you hear terms like dark matter and dark energy, it's not clear the distinction, right? Because when we talk about matter and energy, there's that equation e equals mc squared. That's the conversion between energy and matter. How much matter do you need to get energy and how much energy do you need to get matter? Um, so they use the terms dark energy, dark matter. So dark matter is stuff in the universe that's kind of affecting how we see matter. But we talked about the universe expanding, right? So it started with the Big Bang, expanded really fast, and then kind of slowed down. And then he talks through the different equations, like this last piece there with the little horseshoe, this uh, omega and stuff like that. If we have a universe that is expanding, we have uh, an omega that's less than the number. If we have an ex a universe that's steady state, it's not expanding or contracting, then the, this omega is one. And if we have 
uh, a universe that's collapsing in on itself, omega is greater than one. So that's kind of this equation that they follow. What we found is that the universe is slightly can constantly expanding. It's not, it's not too much. It's like a, a small number, but the universe itself will expand eventually out into nowhere. So the question came up, if everything we see has gravity and that gravity is pulling it all together, what's pushing it apart? Why are we expanding? And that's what they're calling dark energy. So dark energy is the pressure against the universe that's causing it to get bigger. Now, remember how I said the universe itself can expand faster than the speed of light? That's that's a rule that we don't quite understand, but it's a legit. Things inside the universe can't. This a dark energy is what's pushing us apart. So in, a, in billions and billions of years down the road, when we look up in the sky, we're not going to see anything. If we survive it and we're still around, all the galaxies, all the, you know, all the uh, different stars and systems will push apart from each other. They'll be so far apart, we won't be able to see them. So, and as far as we can tell, that is the way it is. They've decided that we're not going to collapse. Gravity is not going to suck everything back together. We are constantly just going to be slightly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what this dark energy is. Um, and we, we mentioned Einstein's blunder. So there was an early, early set of scientists. If you ever talk to people that want the earth to be 6,000 years old, they'll, they'll bring up uh, Hoyle. Hoyle was kind of against the Big Bang. He was kind of against all this other stuff, you know. But there was this idea that the universe was steady state. You know, it's just everything was there and we all have it and it just keeps creating and destroying and creating and destroying. Um, but Einstein's like, I can't figure out what's going on here. So I'm going to come up with this number. Boom. And he came up with this number called the gravitational constant. And it was the thing that made all the equations work. But it turns out that that's the thing that's pushing the universe apart. And that's the thing that Einstein's like, yeah, that was my biggest mistake. I should have, he didn't like the, uh, he didn't like the guys that were talking about um, the quantum stuff, the quantum vacuum and the quantum pressure and all the other stuff. And so he said, yeah, that's a bunch of nonsense. God doesn't play dice with the universe and all the other stuff. But he eventually had to back it off and say, nope, that's, there is something there. And that was, that's kind of his blunder. That's that thing there. Um, but yeah, there's, so so I don't know if they've come up with an idea to convert dark energy to matter like we do with regular matter and energy. I think they've just labeled it. This is this piece and that's that piece. But um, any questions about your cold, dark demise that you're going to have over the next 100 billion years? <laughs> this, this, this was something I'd never heard. heard I, I maybe heard of dark energy, but I had no clue what it was. And it, it you know, I kind of pictured it like a, a bubble you know how a bubble grows right. and grows and grows until it, it pops and right. it's like you can see inside the you can see inside the bubble but what's making the bubble grow you know you can't see what's making the bubble grow but something's making it grow and that's kind of how i pictured this dark energy but it's just mind-boggling to me it's like what this pressure is coming from what how's something pushing space out you know i right. it's just mind-boggling to think about it and, and this is my suspicion, just me saying it. I think that's the connection between dark energy and dark matter. Dark matter may be creating this dark energy presser. I don't know enough to say whether that's true or not, or if Neil deGrasse talked about it in his book. I can't remember him making that connection. But but yeah, between the two, we've got all this dark energy that's all floating around all the galaxies, and there's a connection to this pressure. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, and this, you know, I was mentioning in our, our pre-meeting, um, I was listening to this yesterday, walking around Caltech, which is down the street from my house, and just, you know, reminded me that the Caltech scientist, uh, Kip Thorne, who is an ex-Mormon, won the Nobel Prize in 2017 for his uh, work, uh, LIGO, and, and detecting the waves. Oh, uh, yeah. So I think that's, you know, kind of a little ex-Mormon tie-in that... Um, it's interesting. How much time we got? It's twelve. It's I got twelve eighteen. How much time have we got left? I don't want to run out of time. Give you guys time to talk through ideas. Probably, um, we typically go till you know, like we can go up to two hours, <laughs> and then we hang on and talk for another hour. So, um, yeah, you could you could definitely probably go another half an hour. 
but you're right. We're just kind of making our way through. There's so much to talk about. So gotcha. we face ourselves, okay. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess mainly after after reading this book, I just want to make sure people have a have a grasp of what Neil's trying to talk about. If if something's just way out there, we can talk a little bit more about that. I don't know if I can answer it, but go ahead, Tom. Another just question came to mind. That's that's what this does to me. I, I, I'm thinking about the bubble thing, you know, when you brought that up, Landon, and I was reading about that, and I was thinking about all these pressures, and you can't see them, and the universe, it keeps expanding, and I get, I go, how does it keep expanding, like, yep. was there already space out there it could expand into, or eventually is the whole thing going to blow up again? Or is it going to, you know what I mean? It's like, is it going to, it, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm getting into that area where my mind's blown and I don't know what to say anymore. But it's, I'm thinking like, well, what stopped it from just ending the way that it started? Or it has a conclusion where it, it just winds down or it blows up like a star, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I just started thinking about that. I just thrown that out there. It just made me think about it. I can't help but ask these kind of weird questions like this. Yeah, no good questions. Uh yeah, JJ. Oh, I'm getting myself there. Yeah, this was uh, the whole expanding thing that was uh, a big deal when the Hubble telescope was first uh, put out there. People knew the idea of, well, we knew very well the universe was expanding. We just didn't have the numbers right. We were assuming eight to 12 billion years. Some people had an estimate of 20 billion years for the age of the, the universe. Um, they reduced it down to, well, we have a pretty accurate down to 13.72, I guess. But even more recently, you showed the picture of, uh, I guess, uh, that was done at UCLA, I think, that one, uh, the CMB. Oh, yeah. Um, that's officially the oldest image we have of the, the universe. But when that was being done, people did not know if the universe was going to continue expanding. They, right. At one point, we had this idea of a big crunch. Like, is it going to just stop and then fall back in itself? And the big surprise was it's expanding. And the further out you are, it's expanding faster and faster. And it doesn't look like it's going to slow down anytime. Well, I was going to say soon, but we don't know what time is right now. But it's, uh, yeah, it just doesn't look like it's slowing down at all. It's just getting bigger and bigger. And it's expand. It is everything. It's expanding right. I guess, into itself. There's nothing out there. No, it's, yeah, that's, I, I'm always... This is where some of my frustration comes from. Like, like you're saying, right? We had these conversations, but let's say like 1950, people were proposing these ideas, right? In 1970, they were kind of getting more information. In 1980, at some point, we kept talking like it's a done deal, but it really wasn't a done deal, right? And and like you said, when I was younger, and we'll talk about it in the next chapter, we all we all knew there's planets out there, but we didn't really know. Like that just showed up in the nineties, you know? And so it's nice. Like you said, eventually they come out and officially say, yeah, we're just going to grow forever. You know, because back in like the early 2000s, nineties, we're like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it'll bend in on itself. And as those numbers became clear and as a Tubble, Hubble started giving us more data and we can get those more precise, more price, like, ah, okay. I see that. I see that we're going to eventually just go to a cold, dark place. So yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating uh anything else on chapter six well doesn't it logically have to keep expanding because we're all going to become gods and get our own planets and we need all that space for our own planets i mean i don't know if you know but two uh, years ago we lost our planet <laughs> oh kidding. okay never mind they keep changing no i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah exactly um okay so he spent a chapter on talking about the elements. Uh, it was kind of an interesting chapter, but it was more rudimentary. So like Landon pointed out and Neil deGrasse Tyson pointed out, when the, when, the, when the Big Bang happened, and I tend to call it the big expansion, right? So we had this tiny thing and the hydrogen was created first, right? Boom, all this hydrogen is created. 10% of that that came out of there was helium and the rest of it was lithium. That was it. That's all that came out of the Big Bang. And then the question became, and, and this was another thing, like 
when I was younger, where did all the elements come from? We don't know. They're just in the planet. They just came here. But recently, maybe 20 years ago, I think there was a Nobel Prize for, uh, they said, you know, all the next elements like carbon, oxygen, uh, silicon, all those things, they come from the heart of a star. So in our in our star right now, the sun that we're following, he's generating, he's taking hydrogen and helium and he's creating uh deter, you know, he's creating the next set of elements up to what do we decide? Lead? No, iron. I always get those two mixed up. Iron. So all the if you look at the periodic table, you got he, helium, hydrogen, then lithium, boron, carbon, blah, blah, blah. But now you get down to iron. Everything up to iron is created in the heart of a sun. And as the sun does that fusion and creating those elements and elements and elements, it eventually runs out of energy at iron and it can't make any more. So then the question is, well, we can go out in the desert and we can dig up uranium. Where does uranium come from? When that star loses its ability to create any more material, it explodes into novas and supernovas. And during that reaction, which is highly energetic, you get everything else. You get uranium, plutonium, all the little heavy elements after that show up in those, in those things. All that stuff is spewed out into the galaxy or out into the universe. The clouds and stuff then reform and create more stars. I don't know if you can see, if you can see me on the thing, notice this little picture right here. This is a star in the Taurus Nebula. So you got Orion, he's chasing Taurus. If you go look into Taurus, this little star right here is creating a new solar system. Um, this is a 100,000 year old star. He's only been around for a little bit. He's about 400 uh, light years from Earth. But this star in all this gas and clouds is going to form another solar system over the next couple hundred thousand years. And it's going to have planets and it's going to have all this stuff forming. And so that all kind of gets recreated and re-exploded and more stars and re-exploded and more stars. Um, sorry, I'm talking about the periodic table and constellations. So if you look, okay, go ahead. <laughs> we'll, we'll interrupt my yakking there, Melissa. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you'd no, finish no, what no, you're, you're saying. I just didn't want to forget. I wanted to ask a question. So in the book, it said um, in chapter seven, helium, helium is the second simplest and second most abundant element in the universe. Right. Yet I try and go to get my balloons blown up and there's a helium shortage. So I that makes me a little nervous. If somebody could maybe explain that to me, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> I need to pay more because they just big helium. No, I'm just kidding. So- helium the way the place we get helium and hydro yeah helium it comes out of the oil manufacturing fields so when you go dig up and uh, and uncap oil helium comes out with some of the other gases and stuff like that and we capture that and we can resell it the problem is is we can't manufacture it we we have to get it from the sun or from these old processes so I don't know if that fully answered the question, but the helium that we have and we can get comes from the oil manufacturing. Go ahead, Landon. Yeah, I was, uh, the thing I found fascinating about this was that hydrogen and helium basically formed the, the first suns or stars and evidently they were pretty massive because they were big hydrogen. But the, the thing they talked about uh, in the book was how those big helium hydrogen suns, they, they were really short lived, maybe a hundred million years is all the sun would burn before it would burn out and create more. And then it would blow up. And like you said, and then, then they started getting to be where they had stars could live longer and longer because they had more and more of these uh, ma materials that they could, that they could rely on. So now, you know, our sun's what, 4 billion years or something like that. Uh, old, but the the first stars were just a hundred million years old, and they just keep exploding. So all these elements have been in stars, exploded, become a star again, exploded, become a star again, exploded. Even the the very fiber of us, everything that's in us, has been a star that's exploded. Multiple stars that have exploded o over the history of the universe. So just again, amazing to think that all this little elements that make up your body. <laughs> have been stars that have exploded in the past. Your star stuff. 
Yeah, exactly. JJ? It's just going to answer the question about the helium uh, shortage thing. It's helium and hydrogen are very light elements, so they escape the Earth's gravity pretty easily. That's part of the problem there. Even right. though hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, um, we can't simply extract it. We can't extract it out of water, but it, it's an endomorphic reaction. It, it uses more energy to, to extract the hydrogen than the hydrogen would be worth. And um, yeah, we just need better ways of harnessing the hydrogen or helium in the universe if we really need it that way. Specifically for hydrogen, because it can be used as an energy source. So I thought it said entity. I thought it said something about that all of the helium and maybe it was hydrogen as well, but it's already been created that we're going to have though. So if we're just it's escaping and we can't harness it, does that mean we'll literally run out of it? Well, you know, not, I mean, while people are living <laughs> before the the sun explodes into us or not. <laughs> Well, it's not that. The helium on the earth, once it's extracted from the oil processes or other various methods of getting it, I mean, from the balloon, it's once you pop that thing, it's, the helium will escape and pretty quickly, well, not pretty quickly, but eventually leave the earth's uh, atmosphere. Right. Um, so the helium that's around here, it doesn't, it doesn't trap here. Whereas other elements, uh, carbon, oxygen, or meteorites, rocks, uh, I mean, as the earth is going around the sun, they'll fall into the earth because they are a little heavier and they'll, they'll be subject to the gravity, but helium and hydrogen can't escape. With the hydrogen, fusion is the process of turning hydrogen into helium. So there can be, we can create more helium. It's the base particles that have all been created, but, um, and most of the hydrogen was created very early on, but the helium, that's how the sun makes its energy. Um, we can look at the sun through well, various methods and we can determine that it's turning it into helium and eventually when the hydrogen is reduced when there's not enough hydrogen to convert more to helium that's when the sun's going to start dying other stars will go nova they'll collapse in itself our star is not big enough for that so um that's good news well that that's five billion years down the road assuming andromeda and other things don't hit us and uh, assuming we haven't evolved into anything else but don't tell other people that we might be on our own planets one day. I don't know. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, Luann. Oh, you're still on mute. You're muted, Luann. Sorry. Um, I just want to know which it is. Uh, it seems I'm confused. Uh, the helium, we've, we've said that the helium produced at the Big Bang is all there is, and yet uh, fusion on the sun changes hydrogen into helium so we get more, uh, are both true? Yes, yeah. So if you look at, I, okay, so these percentages that we're showing on the chart here is the percentages of the original helium hydrogen. But if you take a sun that has full of hydrogen, it will create more helium. But the ratio of helium to hydrogen, I think, kind of stays similar. So, so yes, in our sun today, our sun that we're looking at every day, he is creating helium, uh, and and he's creating other other things too. So though, so yes, they're kind of both true. the 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 amount of hydrogen in the universe is kind of constant, but the helium I think can be created uh, because of the nuclear fusion of suns. Uh, did that did that kind of clear that up? The problem is, is here on Earth, like what JJ was saying, is it's way more expensive to create helium. We can't we can't chemically kind of put them together. We have to have a nuclear fusion to create helium, and we can create them, but it's highly expensive energy wise to do that. Uh, we don't have a good way of capturing it from the sun, but helium's you know helium's burning in the sun. The helium that we do have, and, and somebody can probably correct me on my re reference, we didn't used to use helium. Helium was just existed. And helium didn't become useful until World War II. Most of the helium reserves that we have was captured during World War II, and we're still using those reserves today. And those reserves are kind of the things that are disappearing. Um, and so, like I said, I can be corrected on that, but 
Yeah, the only way we can kind of capture helium that we know how to do that is through the oil mining processes that we've gone through in the late 20th century. Um, but yeah, trying to create helium for ourselves is very expensive. But within stars, all the stars around us, they are creating helium. That is true. Okay. That, that, that kind of makes sense or maybe is a little more confusing. Well, uh, as much sense as I can absorb. Um, <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, isn't the universe going to run out of hydrogen because the stars are burning it all up? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. My, my suspicion is that we will expand so far that, yeah, it will consume the hydrogen that it exists. So what, if you look at, if you look at clouds, so we talked a little bit about galaxies and nebulas, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you look up in the sky, we talked about the Orion constellation and to the right of Orion is Taurus. And to the right of that is a little cluster of stars called the Pleiades. The Pleiades is just a whole bunch of gas and it's creating stars all over because it has all that gas. It has it right there. It can do it. But if you look like by Orion, there's not a lot of gas. So there's no stars forming there. So there are pockets of gas throughout the universe that are forming stars. Eventually, hundreds of billions of years, that gas will expand and be consumed and be gone. So yeah, at some point in the future, I, I, I'm going to have to have somebody confirm this, but yeah, all the gas will get consumed and it'll be gone. Sounds like something to lose sleep over. <laughs> yeah, not in our Actually, not in our lot of times. <laughs> yeah, Bruce. I'm going to lose sleep over the whole thing coming to an end when my personal coming to an end is probably in the next 20 years. <laughs> probably won't, I probably won't worry about the hundred you know a hundred billion years from now if everything stops existing. I'm going like, you know, um, I had a good time while I was here. Yeah. What's I've I've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say this a couple of times. He's like, uh, we've been around, the earth's been around longer. It'll be around a lot longer than us. Go ahead, Tom. And just, and just, you know, what, what is this? It's like a big chemistry reaction thing that's going on here or something. Yes. And it's these, these elements start to dissipate and are not so prevalent. And, you know, what's that going to do to the universe? What happens? What other things might be created because of lack of something that, or lack of the pressure or something forces pushing here, pushing, as it changes, it it sounds like it would just continue changing and evolving based on whatever it is at the time or whatever elements are available at the time. Or, And I know we're not going to be here, so I'm not losing too much sleep, but it's just fascinating <laughs> to think about. It just looks like a big science project and, and you just set it off to, to go do and it's just, it's a big reaction. It's just occurring. It's it's And it's almost like random to some degree, but not because it's following some sort of scientific laws and whatnot. So anyway, that's all I had. That's it. I, I feel like, Tom, that that is a great question. And I think you need to write a paper on it and put together a model <laughs> and get your evidence and do your hypothesis. <laughs> Excellent okay. questions. Excellent questions. Um, so yeah, this chapter is all about how the periodic table, the names and stuff like that. Let's see. Chapter eight. On being round. Okay. I, I feel like when this book was written and put together and kind of before that, I don't know where the flat earthers came from. I don't know why they're around. I don't understand anything that they're talking about. But I think this chapter subtly was Neil deGrasse Tyson saying, what is going on, people? So if we look at any kind of fluid, now, what does that mean? That's a general term. When, an, when a volcano erupts, it is taking fluid rock. It is, it is melting rock into fluid, magma, and moving it around. What we find is that gravity, the gravitational force, causes things to go round, right? So everything in the, everything in the universe, if left by itself, will turn into round things. Galaxies, nebulas, stars, planets, asteroids, they're all basically round. Um, when you look at our Milky Way, it looks like a big flat disk. So why is it not a big round ball? Because as you start spinning things, it flattens out. Now, if you look at our planet Earth, our planet Earth is technically kind of a, 
uh, what is it called? An ellipsoid. Uh, it's kind of squished out at the at the center. The equator, so it's not a sphere. But if you measure it on the size, what what you you know how you look at a globe and it's got little bumps for plant for mountains and you can kind of feel the terrain on the Earth. If you take the Earth and scale it down to the size of a globe, it would be as smooth as a cue ball because those bumps of mountains are so small compared to the size of the earth that it's just basically smooth. So they build globes to give you kind of a textual feel, but you would never feel that on, on the size of the earth. But it is technically a kind of a squishy egg looking thing around the equator is a little bit wider. If we sped the earth up more and more and made it more liquid, it would become a little flat disc. So, yeah. So that's kind of, this whole chapter is about how do we deal with with round things and flat things and everything goes to a sphere. And so no, the earth is not flat. We don't have an edge. There's nobody conspiracy about the great ice wall. You can go take a trip around the South Pole and enjoy it all you want. Anyway, go ahead, Tom. It, just quick, quick, quick. Is it because the, the earth is spinning that it gets this shape? Is that the is that the takeaway? Is that what you just said? If it was yeah. going faster, it would it would it would yeah. kind of squ squish out. Okay, that's yeah. why it's okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, Bruce. Didn't didn't I? I think it was on Reddit. Read someplace that there's a a faction of Mormon apologists who think that the Earth's middle is water, and that's how the flood happened, and not. Ah, uh, you've brought uh, Rod Meldrum into the conversation. Oh, is that the guy? Okay. <laughs> And that, that's Rebecca's family's prophet. Yes. Rod Meldrum is a, yeah, he's kind of, he's got a big following, but he think he thinks that the, the reason we have the earth's flood is because all the water in the center of the earth came to the surface and then it went back to the center. So the center of the earth is full of water and that's where all the water from the flood went to. Uh, I thought people lived there. So is that Aquaman? Uh yeah yeah, <laughs> the like journey to the center journey to the center of the earth. We got uh, like a, a dose of dough in square dancing. The water came out and the water went in. There you go. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of people that follow him and they kind of believe it. And they're in they they have the Heartland model of the the Book of Mormon and it's not down in South America and stuff. So, uh, what's the term pseudoscience? So you can convince yourself of a lot of things and you can have a lot of evidence that isn't really evidence, but it makes sense. <laughs> you know? Uh, so the question is, what's the question, Tom? How do you know? How do you know this? And, and they're very convincing, uh, flatter, you know, I don't know if you ever want to try to listen to a flat earther debate. They've got some convincing arguments that you're like, hmm, okay. But eventually that all kind of falls apart, but. Yeah, any any other questions about being round? Why am I so round? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you move faster, then we'll right. elongate. So maybe it's sort of like a diet plan. <laughs> spin spin around in your basement. Just spin. <laughs> um, let's see. So he spent a chapter on talking about how we see things, right? So when you get our eyeballs have evolved to see a certain spectrum of light, right? And so in that spectrum, if you notice here, there's that little light in the middle of the visible. You've got radio waves, which are way down. You got microwaves, you got infrared, you got visible, you got ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma rays. These, all these things exist, right? But we can't see or detect them. And so this chapter talks a little bit about how did we start detecting them? And we started creating things that could detect them. The, the radio waves, the two scientists that were listening to radio astronomy, uh, we started detecting stuff in the, in, the, in the radio bands. And then we started detecting gamma ray bursts. Uh, we created, when we started creating uh, nuclear reactions, we had to have detectors, you know, uh, Geiger counters and stuff like that. We put a couple uh, space probes into space and all of a sudden, because we wanted to be able to detect nuclear detonations from Russia. So when we put those probes into space, we all of a sudden started detecting nuclear detections from outer space. 
all of a sudden pulsars became visible, you know, uh, neutron stars became visible, gamma radiation. All of a sudden we found out there's all this stuff going on in space. Um, there, there are, there are stories of, uh, people detecting these things and the United States government saying, you know, don't tell anybody just yet. We got to figure this out because they weren't sure if it was Russia coming in to get us or what, or little green man, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, so we went through this thing just recently. We recreated uh, LIGO uh, that Bruce has talked a little bit about. LIGO is a mile long detector. We have two of them. Uh, that detects these warp of gravitational waves as they pass through the earth. Now, the thing we're looking at here is we have a laser that's going a couple miles back and forth, bouncing back and forth, and we are looking for a detection of the width of an atom. So these are very precise instruments. And as soon as we turn them on, we started getting signals. So Right now, there are signals passing through us probably every couple minutes of black holes colliding, neutron stars colliding, and they're twisting the very fabric of space that we're living in. And these are called the LIGO detectors. And you can go get that information and play with it. But yeah, every couple every couple weeks, they'll have another announcement. You know, we found these, these stars over here and they're colliding. And then they, we found these, these black holes that are orbiting. They're going to collide soon. So... This whole chapter was how do we detect things and how do we see things, you know? And if you want to get talking about evolution and how our eyes can see, you know, we we adapted to be able to see visible light, but we didn't adapt to see ultraviolet. We could, and there probably is a need to do that. Bruce? This is kind of tangential, but I've been working on my health and, and some of the doctors that I follow um, believe that as human beings, we need to be out in the light and not just the visible light, but the ultra red, ultraviolet infrared and stuff because we are animals that developed in that and people sitting inside um, buildings with uh, UV protectant glass and stuff. So for a healthy, healthy life, you need to get out in the sunshine some because that's how we evolved. And they talk about, you know, it's not the visible light and it goes through clothes and stuff like that. You just need to be out in nature and out in the sun because that's how we developed. And we we didn't develop in a dark enclosed room with artificial light. I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing that two areas of stuff that I'm interested in kind of overlap a little. Yeah, we've spent we've spent hundreds of thousands of years in that environment and suddenly we can control our environment and we put ourselves in a house. <laughs> Got rid of the So yeah, there's pro there's probably something to that. I don't that's not a bad idea. Uh anything else about light and all sorts of different lights? Okay. Let's see, we talked a little bit about between the galaxies, but what's between the planets, right? So who's sad that Pluto is no longer a planet? <laughs> that was kicked out of our, our nine planets. Um, so we talk about the things that exist. We've got the sun, we've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, you know, the planets. Uh, what's between those things? We've got the asteroid belt. So between Mars and Jupiter or Earth and Mars, I can't remember which one it is. There is a chunk of of stuff that didn't form as a planet uh and it's right there between us and it's called the asteroid belt and it's just a bunch i think if you take all the matter that's in the asteroid belt that's between mars and jupiter earth and mars wherever it is you can put together something a little bit bigger than our moon so it's not a lot of stuff but it's all spread out there we as we orbit the earth we run through things that are also orbiting sorry as we orbit, as our earth orbits the sun we run through things that are also orbiting the sun in in similar areas and so we'll have meteor showers like the perseids meteor showers it'll be us going through debris that was floating around we've got all these chunks of stuff following us around as we go out farther so jupiter one of the great things that Jupiter did for us and did for life is that it attracted a lot of this debris. So one of the definitions of a planet is that it has cleared its debris field. So Earth, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, they've cleared all the debris. 
Jupiter has helped us. It's kind of gathered up all these asteroids and junk and stuff like that. Pluto has not. So that's kind of one of the distinctions why it became a planetoid. Um, outside of Pluto, we have, let's see, what do we call it? The Oort cloud or the Kyber belt. I think the Kyber belt is inside. So we've got this chunk of stuff that's floating around just outside of where Pluto is. And sometimes we get asteroids from there. We get uh, objects. I think Halley's Comet is one of them. The Halebach Comet. There was a there was a object that came through past Earth a couple of years ago. Uh, was it the High High Tate? But it was a big oblong cigar looking shaped object that did not come from the Kyber Belt or the Oort Cloud. He truly was an object just passing through uh, interstellar space. And then outside of that, we've got, uh, in, you know, the Kyber Belt and the Oort Cloud and all the stuff. So there's all this stuff just floating around. As a side note, it wasn't in the book, but it's kind of interesting. Any fans? Oh, sorry, Bruce, you got your hand up. I'm, yeah. Well, I, I was just going to make the comment. When I was younger at work and we had some people interested in, in astronomy and stuff, I can remember going and we'd, I think the one time we did, we went up into the Santa Monica Mountains over by above Malibu to get to a, a less light polluted area to see the Perseid meteor shower. And now I'm sitting there going like, huh, I wonder when that is, because I don't know. And I'm going like, oh, maybe that would be good to go to a uh, camping trip or a little trip out, not camping, staying in Palm Springs and going out to Joshua Tree where there's less light to see the meteor shower because this is all bringing up all the these thoughts of how do I how do we understand how the world works and meteors and asteroids and all that stuff you know it's yeah amazing. yeah we took uh we took everybody out to Antelope Island one year a couple years ago just to watch one of the meteor showers and it it turned out kind of fun if you could if you have the patience and it's warm you could go out and sit there and watch them most of them, like I think the Perseids come around in December, January, or November. There's one that happens in August that's kind of fun. But yeah, look up a look up a local uh, space. You know what's going to happen this week, and plan a camping trip around a per, uh, meteor shower, and then just go lay out on the grass and, for an hour. And it's it's kind of fun watching them stream by. Um, oh, I was going to say my side note is: is anybody fans of the band Queen? Okay, Brian May, the guitarist for Queen, he was on his way to get his PhD when he decided to go with this guy and go tour. And he was writing a PhD about how we know how fast we're moving through the solar system. And he started that PhD, but then ended up going on tour with Queen for 20 years. But just a couple of years ago, he went back and finished his PhD. In the meantime, we kind of figured out what his PhD was. But if you want to go read his PhD, he's published it, uh, I think it was about 10, 5, 10 years ago. He finished and got his degree in astrophysicist. So very brilliant guy in the band Queen. Uh, Jackie. Sorry, didn't mean to have my hand up. I love Queen. That's it. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Uh, let's see any other questions there's just a, he just talks through this chapter about all a bunch of stuff that's just floating around between all the planets let's see did you put your hand up again jackie no why is it going up ah, i mean wow. I think... no worries i didn't want to miss you okay let's see chapter 11 what do we got on chapter 11 exoplanets now this one to me is really kind of exciting because so what are we taught in the book of abraham that all this collab, these planets, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people for the longest time believe that there was planets. Because there must be planets, right? Because we've got stars, that we've got stuff. Now, the fun thing is, is that we never actually identified one. So we've never identified a planet until late 1990s. In the late 1990s, there was an observe. There was a two people that, uh, I probably should get their names, but they got the Nobel Prize for saying, Here's how we detect a planet. Now, the first way we did it is let's look at the uh, wobble. So Jupiter and the sun do this little dance, right? So Jupiter and the sun pull on each other through gravity. 
the the center point in which Jupiter and the sun orbit each other is a point outside of the center of the sun. It's outside of the chromosphere of the sun. There's a point that, so they're both kind of like orbiting each other, right? And so they noticed that if we watch suns, we can see this little wobble. And so they started looking for this wobble. That was their theory. And then what do we do with theories? We try to find evidence, we go observe, and they found these suns that were wobbling. And the first exoplanets were created, or not created, discovered. And once they discovered that, they said, hey, what other ways can we see it? And they said, what if we watch the light that comes out from a sun as something moves in front of it? And so you get this dimming that happens. So these are two different ways that they experimented on how we can determine a planet. And so they created what's called the Kepler Observation Space Satellite. So they put this satellite up. And all it did is looked at a certain point in space for a couple of years. And by watching the light dimming process, and I maybe some of the wobbling came in, but it was mainly light dimming. We came up with thousands of stars or thousands of planets. So that was what the Kepler program was, was to go find stars. About four or five years ago, and it's not mentioned in the book, they, they launched the Gaia uh, planet observation. So Kepler was supposed to look at just a point in space. What do we got there? And they found dozens of them, right? Hundreds of them. The Gaia is going to look all the way across the entire spectrum, which is a much more ambitious program. But we should be seeing all sorts of planets all over the place. And that's what the Gaia program is. I, I, I don't have any information on it. We can go look it up. But uh, yeah, so we have now discovered exoplanets. So if anybody's following James Webb, James Webb did, there's a star system called Trappist 7. There's seven little hard rocky planets around a planet called Trappist that uh, we think might be in the habitable zone. And I think uh, James Webb has published some indications of those stars as basically taking a picture of a planet outside of our solar system. So... This is really exciting. It's been going on for about 20 years and it's kind of one of the big things that, you know, what can we do? What can we see? And he talks a little bit about how we can detect, you know, methane. You remember the methane gas? That's a, that's a signature of life. So we're finding signatures of planets that have methane coming through their atmospheres. There was a big excitement a couple of years ago about Mars. We found on Mars, we found methane coming out of the Mars. So it's got to have life. Turned out to be a natural phenomenon that's not life. So we kind of got to weed that out and learn more about it. But yeah, so this chapter was all about planets. And, and I think it's kind of fun because over the next 20, 30 years, that Gaia project and some of these other things, we're going to get to the point that, you know, we can see what's happening. Okay. All right. Uh, any, any really questions about X chapter? Just too much. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so chapter 12, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about, you know, his opinions about what's going on. If anybody's seen the old series, uh, Cosmos, uh, with Carl Sagan, they talk about, you know, where do we go? What do we do? Why are we blowing ourselves up? What should we do? Can we survive? And he talks a little bit about his reflections on that. So uh, it, it, like we've talked about big things and small things, we're on this planet, what's going to happen in millions of years? Should we sleep, sleep, leave sleep, lose sleep over it? The thing we need to lose sleep over is why are we killing ourselves? Why are we letting these things destroy us when we're so precious? We're only unique in this universe you know as far as we know we have yet to detect life anywhere else we we may be the only ones we may be the first ones we may be the last ones we don't know um but yeah let's take the last few minutes and and share people's thoughts on where we go from here and and does this give us a better perspective on treating our fellow man better does it give us a perspective of hating our neighbor i don't know where should we go bruce well i just you know come back to my family who are mostly TBM, um, basically they just don't see any reason to protect the earth, to protect people, you know, because, you know, God's going to come destroy everything, going to fix it all. 
And so we can pollute and we can cause damage and, and it doesn't matter. And boy, I think that's one of the key negative aspects of the culture that we grew up in. Because a realistic view is like, oh yeah, we need to stop damaging the environment, stop damaging people and stuff. So that's just my thought. Great, great thought. Tom? This is just an observation I've had since reading the book. And then um, again, just reviewing it with you, Joe, which you've done a great job. This, is, this isn't always easy to do science. Um, hopefully, I mean, I was just saying it's like, if you don't read this book and we're trying to get into this, it's kind of like, oh, this is going to be gnarly trying to understand. Stuff. But, but, oh, anyway, but what I was thinking of is going back to that very second, the second slide again, you don't have to go back there, but just seeing how the, the, the whole universe developed in this like chemical reaction thing, whatever, all the elements doing this thing and, and creating all this and then life fast forwarding to, to life being able to be formed here on the earth and thinking about the energy at the beginning has become a part of us. We're a byproduct of that, or we're actually some of those elements that were maybe even in the early times of this creation. Sorry, I don't mean to use that word, the big bang or whatever, the start of this. And now we're able to think about it at least we think we are, unless this is a simulation, but we can actually now see what happened, which is just wild. It's like this whole thing is now looking at itself somehow and is conscious of it. So we're kind of like the consciousness of, of this whole experiment or whatever this is, which is, is, is continuing to blow my mind. So that's my observation today. Great, great observation. Luann? Oh, we're on mute again. Uh, we're still on mute, Luann. I'm not hearing you. There, right? Yeah. yeah there okay, we go. I'm old. You'll have to forgive me. <laughs> uh, I just thought the reflections were beautiful, and I thought what what uh, Tom said was pretty profound too. But uh, just wanted to read one of them that I, I think is just really good, and it says. The cosmic perspective opens our eyes to the universe, not as a benevolent cradle designed to nurture life, but as a cold, lonely, hazardous place, forcing us to reassess the value of all humans to one another. I think that's just so profound. Excellent. Yeah. Rebecca? I just wondered what anyone thought, anyone's thoughts are on this. So. I know a lot of people would read this book or have this information and say, and God put this all in motion. You know, this is God. They see God in it. I don't see it that way at all. I'm blown away by, you know, maybe the randomness, the incredibleness, just all of it. But other people, of course, this, this actually strengthens their belief in God. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Just wondering other opinions. I'll, I'll I'll voice one quick opinion. Yeah. Uh, uh, same thing like what Bruce was saying is once you realize that we're here alone, all these policies about somebody's going to clean this up, somebody's going to come by. No, nobody's coming by. This is us. We need to take care of it. So yeah, go ahead. Let's see. I don't know who's next. Luann? Um, just wanted to say when I was active Mormon, I just felt so secure because God was going to take care of everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I'm not terrified now. I'm not, but it should be just, just a thought. Yeah. No, Bruce. Well, um, basically so many of the books, I mean, the book club for me, and I I've expressed this before is we were given a narrative of how the world worked and how I fit into it. And the book club is giving me the opportunity to explore, a, I think, a more complete understanding. You know, when I when I stop existing at my death, which is at an unknown point, I'm my energy and, and molecules are going to go back to the universe in, in some form. But also 
that I existed and I'm sitting here and I have friends and I have enjoyment and pleasure is just the most amazing thing and I should enjoy it now, but it's not the narrative that I was taught. And then how do I figure out how do I live and find meaning in my own existence and how I play well with others and stuff like that. The book club is giving me the opportunity to explore with other people willing to talk about it because my family doesn't talk about it. And even most of my close friends don't want to talk about this topic. So that's just some of my thoughts. Yeah, no, it's hard. Uh, Malin? You're muted. I'm also trying to figure out how to get my hand down. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to blame this response on Rebecca because it's all her fault. We know this, so you might as well step up and accept it. She put out a message one day about, and it had a link to one of Neil deGrasse Tyson's, um, it was an interview with a number of uh, astrophysicists at some convention or something that they were having. There was probably six of these people there. And they were talking about the idea that we were living in a simulation. And they asked Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson actually generated the question and then he answered it himself at the end. And he, he was asking these people, well, what do you think the possibility is that we're living in a simulation, you know, like the matrix or something like this? And there were various answers from absolute zero to, you know, they got to him though, when he answered it himself and he said about 90% chance that we're living in a simulation. And the thing is, he has this unique ability, and he says it in several of his books, including the book that I'm currently reading of his, which is about, uh, oh no, it was called Starry Messenger. But anyway, one of the things that he says is that the difficulty that we have as human beings is just to not try and reduce everything down to something that we can understand. He said, there are just so many things that we can't understand that we need to learn to allow the kind of diversity and thinking and stuff that, that is not common for us as human beings. We want to codify everything. We want to know everything. We want to have the answers to everything. And a lot of our problems come from that kind of thinking that, you know, yeah, I understand the world. Well, we, most of us don't understand it. It's, it's so big. There's so many opportunities. And um, I think Landon and I actually had a little interaction on, on Facebook about this, but uh, I mean, you look at somebody like that whose thinking is just so broad and has such an immense perspective and you compare it to the way that most people like Bruce was saying in religions and different you know groups and stuff that you might associate with you know how they're they just don't get it and they and they won't allow you know it's like you insist upon rights for yourself, you know, I have to be free, I have to have this, I have to have this. And yet you don't allow that same freedom of expression and that freedom of thought and stuff to other people. But that is one, of the, so that kind of goes along with it. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Uh, Nelson? Yeah, just clarified, you know, how we get dinosaurs on earth that's so young you did <laughs> an asteroid or whatever hits another planet it causes such an explosion and throws debris clear across the universe and uh, it'll land on other places so that really helped clarify for me yes dinosaurs came from another planet of, um, some collision that happened somewhere else 
And and Adam and Eve popped out of that asteroid and took over. Yes. So, you know, it puts it all together, puts it all in perspective for us. So I, I thought it was great, great book though, and great presentation too. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was really good. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. That was absolutely amazing. So much to go through and you just, you made it very clear and simple and you supported what was in the book. That was, whew, I'm glad you took that one and I didn't have to. <laughs> All right, let's quickly, um, let's have Nancy. I think that's our next slide after we've all said thank you and yay on this book. Um, yes, thank you again, Joe, incredible. Um, let's go over to Nancy, who is our discussion leader for our February book, uh, The Body Keeper Score. I've got it here somewhere. And she's going to give us a little uh, a little preview mm -hmm. of this. This is supposed to be really, really amazing. So let's hear from Nancy. If she's still here. I know we're going over a little time. Is <laughs> she still here? No, I, I'm still here. She's still here. Great. And I think we yes. have a slide for the book, too. There it is. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. The body yeah, so The Body Keeps the Score is our book for next month. And this is a book by a prominent psychiatrist who has been on the forefront of working with people with trauma and understanding what they're going through, what the brain is doing, what the body is doing. And this is the second time I read the book. I read it about a year and a half ago. And at that time, it took me a few months to get through the book because I would read it and then something would would it would take a while for me to process I guess is what I want to say and so I'd put it aside and then I'd pick it up again and put it aside um, he has a lot of good great information in there about kind of weaves it in the history of um, mental health treatments and then also especially advances in the last 40 years with different types of medication, um, the neuroimaging equipment and other things as well, as well as the um, designation of PTSD as a diagnosis, which was less than 40 years ago, which seems kind of astounding when it's such a part of our culture now. Um, but maybe not a lot of understanding of what people actually go through. So I, um, and then he ends the book with a lot of treatments, uh, different treatment options that he has used successfully with his, the, his patients. Um, so I would really encourage you all to read it. I think we'll have a lot to talk about and, um, and just know too, maybe a little bit of a trigger warning. There are stories that he talks about um, people's trauma and what they've been through. And I know that it sometimes can be a little triggering when you read those things. So just be aware of that. And I look forward to the discussion. Yep, I do too. Like I said, my oldest son who's um, 27 just loves this book, recommended it to me. And then a lot of other um, members of the book club said they'd either read it or had always wanted to read it. So I think this is going to be amazing. It's, I mean, it looks, it's a little longer book, but I, I think that, you know, there's so many just stories in it and discussion and I think it'll be a quick read. So don't be scared. Uh, it will, it will go faster than yeah. you expect. The yeah. other thing is there is a lot of notes and kind of like um, appendixes at the end. So you're really looking at around 350 pages, which can still be a good length book, especially for this kind of topic, but not maybe as daunting as it looks. <laughs> kind of like Michael um, Quinn's book, right? Just, where half of it was notes. <laughs> right, can, right. Can I just say, sure. yeah, um, it, it's a huge trigger warning for me. So I don't think I'll be able to um, hear the discussion, but the book, uh, pretty much saved my life and it's very 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 spot on wow. and um his his um theories for to use to get better uh they're they definitely work um so i just can't uh recommend it enough and so i give that huge recommendation but i don't think i'll be able to handle the discussion but um i'm glad everybody's seen it and being aware of it and I'm going to have to head out and talk about being triggered. I've got to go to my friends. Uh, her son had the farewell while I listened to book club. And now I'm going to go over to the 
homecoming and telling yep. congratulations. And so wish me luck, guys. We get that. You can do it. All of us do that all the time. You're going to be fine. And thank you for sharing that, Jackie, because we do want to say that. That's why we preview books. Some books, you know, you just, for whatever reason, can't participate. And that everybody understands completely. So I'm glad. But you I think that, we Jackie. need to still read them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, want these books course. banned and I don't want, oh, you know, no. they're, they're important. So I'm yeah. really glad it's out there. But I just think yeah. that we as individuals have to realize what we can handle and not. Yep. No. And that's what it's all about. So awesome. Thanks, Good luck, Jackie. everybody. Report thanks, back. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> Good Bye -bye. luck. Good about you. So, okay. Last couple slides. Okay. Um, for those of you that are new and want to know how to reach out and contact us, if you're not a member of the book club yet, you can email me at thegoodbookclub at mail.com. I can send you information and links. Um, Facebook is where we do most of our interaction, you know, talking about the books and posting about the books through the month. So if you're on social media, that's a really fun way to connect and also get to know each other, which is what this is all about. So um, our logo is that row of books. You can just kind of look for us. We're also on Instagram. Um, sometimes off and on on TikTok if I can figure out how to make it work. So um, if you do send me an email, it often goes to spam in your um, in your email. So make sure you check there. So, all right. So saying that we are done with our official book club and we do stop recording for the mix and mingle. So we will stop the recording and we just like to hang out and talk to each other so much um, that feel free to just uh, get a snack, get a drink. Um, let's just uh, catch up and touch base in the new year. So